Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. Thank you for being here. My name is Ben Hansen. We're glad you found us. This interview is all about God of War Ragnarok, and it is an interview with Matt Sophos, who is the game's narrative director, and Richard Gobert, who is the game's story lead. There are spoilers in this interview. Heads up, we talk about everything in God of War Ragnarok, and we talk about cut content, alternate ideas, why characters solve puzzles so quickly for you. We cover a ton of ground, and for your convenience, we put it all in the timestamps below. If you enjoy the fact that we put timestamps for every MinMax interview, or if you enjoy long-form interviews like this with developers, you can always help support independent games media by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel. We deeply appreciate it. It's a little click for you. It's a huge thing for us. You can also unlock the podcast version of this interview and all of our other interviews and a bunch of other content by going to patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. You unlock the bonus podcast feed there, and you help support independent games media. We greatly appreciate it. And if you're here, you're probably a fan of God of War Ragnarok, and we encourage you to check out the deepest dive on God of War Ragnarok that MinMax did. This is the best, most thorough discussion about the game on the internet. We have Kyle Bossman, Jill Grote, Serial Vasquez, and I unpacking the game along with the community. It is a gigantic game club discussion, but it's on this very channel, so please check that out if you want a very thorough dissection of everything in the game. But, without further ado, here's Richard and Matt. Matt and Richard, welcome to MinMax, guys! Good to see you again, Ben. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's nice to hear your voice. Yeah, we did a big kind of spoilerific interview back at Game Informer, and it was fun to go back and I rewatched part of that just to try and refresh my memory, and I was like, okay, there's a lot of questions already covered there. So we got your history, all that stuff is in that Game Informer interview. Go th give them some views if you really want to, because we want to dive into God of War Ragnarok with spoilers in this. So heads up for everybody watching or listening. We're going to dive into spoilers here. But uh, yeah, first off, congratulations. Uh, hell of an accomplishment you from you all on the team. Um, how are y'all feeling? Do you feel like completely different people from when you shipped God of War 2018? Well, God of War 2018 was certainly a, a, a lot more hair and a lot less pounds ago, so I feel different <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> but uh, and both, I think both our sons are older, and mm. you know we're in different places thinking about different things. Um, but yeah, we're, we're kind of the same idiots that made that one too. Okay, yeah, idiots, yeah, exactly. That's the angle we were taking for this interview, just saying all that. <laughs> just insult territory soon. Uh, Richard, do you feel like um, was one harder than the other, now looking at both of them in the rearview mirror? I feel like uh, this one was harder than than the last. Yeah? Uh, some, some parts were easier, you know, because we knew what the game was. Uh, but, uh, you know, I feel like this one was much bigger and more ambitious. So, you know, there was just a lot more to, to do and a lot more to service this time around. Yeah. How, how has your role changed for, for both of you going into this game? Was it less on the ground writing of combat barks for you two, or is it still all hands on deck for, I'd imagine a, a larger writing team? Yeah, it was different. It was different on the last one. You know, it was it was Matt and I and uh, Orion Walker and Adam Dolan, and uh, and that was it. And it was uh, this one. We had a a, a a bigger roster. You know, we had a, a very terrific, uh, a very talented team of writers. Uh, and the thing is, is they they went above and beyond and dug really deep into their experiences and, and sort of bled on the page for us, which made it a lot easier. You know, they brought so much to the game. Uh, you know, they, they had very different perspectives and such wonderful texture that they, that they added. Um, so it, it, it was very different, you know, because it, it, it was kind of, I don't know, it was, a, it was a step back in a way. Um, but also a step forward. Uh, it's hard to explain. Step back just because, it was more weight on your shoulders for just making sure this giant script and all these moving parts are moving in the right direction. Exactly. Oh God. Yeah. We did a lot of, <laughs> a lot of our writing on this one was in the edit, right? Um, um, there were very few things that we wrote, you know, from the blank page or, or, you know, that we um, went like, this is mine. I'm taking this and nobody's right. touching it. Um, it was a lot of, like the theme of the game, we had to learn to let go a lot <laughs> and let our writers, you know, that, that we, we worked with and hired and, and were incredible teammates, um, you know, take the first steps on, on a lot of things, yeah. which was, you know, that, that's a difficult thing to, to, to let go of. I think it's also, you know, um, uh, it was, 
every game development is very different just because the players are never the same. We like to talk about companies as if like, oh, it's that company and they're right. going to they're gonna do it. They're going to be awesome. Or that's that company and th- this game is going to suck because it's that company. And it's like, that's never the case because the people change so frequently and, and a game development team is, is a group of individuals. It's not, it's not a, a monolithic corporation, even though sometimes it feels like it and we want to pretend like it is. Right. So, um, yeah, it felt different just, just by virtue of the fact, for instance, there's a lot of different places you can go, but, um, you know, goes from Corey Barlog to Eric Williams and they're two very different human beings. I mean, they've worked together for many years and they're good friends and everything, but Corey comes at it from the perspective of a storyteller and an animator. And Eric comes at it from the perspective of a designer, a hardcore designer. And so he, it was, it was different in that respect. And, and Eric came into this, you know, going, um, you know, I've got a lot to learn, uh, you know, in, in the aspect of working with actors and things like that. And, um, I've never seen somebody work so hard at um, at at like taking on the aspect of storytelling and learning all these different shorthands that we have. And, um, you know, it was it was it was impressive. But like you had that immediate shorthand with Corey because it was it's it's role. It, he's he's done writing before. I think so. Right. Was, uh, but he, he he you know Eric was was instrumental in in the plotting you know he was a, a very generous collaborator and he he made narrative a priority uh, not that Corey didn't he also did but uh, you know that's not always the experience at, at game companies um, so you know it was a very happy marriage and he contributed so much to the story uh, it was very personal for him and and uh, you know personal for all of us yeah so Eric's the point person for this game the director. I was I was struck like I feel like in the first video with the unveiling of Ragnarok, it listed Corey as like studio creative director. And then I thought it was interesting in the game in the credits in the beginning, it's like, oh no, just creative director of this game is Corey Barlog, which I understand. Creative director for every studio is different. For a Naughty Dog, it's different from a Santa Monica. But I mean, how often were you working with Corey on this game? Was he in regular meetings or was he more doing his own thing and occasionally checking in? Corey was more doing his own thing. Like okay. he was our gut check a lot, um, especially in the very beginning, making sure that we were servicing the franchise in a way that he wanted us to. He also started out by kind of giving us a few puzzle pieces that is like, you're using these. And we're like, right. okay, we'll figure out how to make those, <laughs> make those work. Um, but uh, yeah, for the most part, you know, he has a lot of respect for Eric um, as you know, Eric, just like Rich and I, who have worked together now, you know, off and on, but mostly on for over 20 years, he has that same relationship with Eric. And I think he wanted to give Eric his space to tell the story and to make the game that he wanted to. So, um, yeah, Eric, uh, Corey was was great at knowing when he should, you know, offer his opinion and other times to kind of step back and let let Eric do what he wanted to do and, and, and let us kind of run free a bit. Yeah, I, I, in interviews that uh, Eric has given, he's talked about how Corey's three pillars, and we're not just going to talk about Corey the entire time, I promise, as much as we all would love to, but how he talked about- Corey three- would love it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that wallflower? Uh, no, but he talked about how the three pillars are like, okay, Ragnarok has to happen, Brock has to die, and Atreus has to leave at the end. Um, and those are coming from Corey, or was that work together amongst all of you, or those were the three pieces on the back of a napkin that he handed to you? I think it was stuff we talked about at the end of the last game. Uh, when, when, when Ragnarok, I mean, not Ragnarok, when 2018 was wrapping up, um, those were conversations that Corey, that Corey and Rich and I had and, and kind of where it felt like things were going. Obviously, the Brock piece, it was not like, it feels like it needs to go here, but, like, you know, right. because we could have we done anything with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think... Um, it was I, it was as much a reminder from Corey of like remember we talked about this and this is what I want I want to make sure you do, um, as, as it was uh, I don't know just kind of where we thought the story might need to go. Yeah, it was it was very uh, the a trans leaving I remember was controversial. Like we all agreed that it needed to happen. That felt emotionally honest, but. If he leaves uh, at the end of the game and you have post-game content, 
then you have to write a whole other set of things for, you know, the companion that you have left. We're doing spoilers, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, go for it. So, you know, you you had to write a whole other set for, I mean, you were going to have to do a lot of that anyway, but there was just more to service if uh, the question had come up, like, can, can he say he's going to leave? You know, but then he doesn't so that, you know, we right. don't have to kind of do that. And it was like, no, he's got to leave because you have to get that sense of him being gone as a player. You're used to him. And now he is gone, you know, and that that absence was important to us. Yeah. Narratively and also for the larger IP, you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. And I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, when Corey was saying these are kind of the three pillars, right? These are the things that I, I, I want you to, to to have in the game. There was also this, he gave us the freedom to do it the way that we wanted to do it. Um, he was like, there's, there's these three things we want you to do, but like, you know, there were versions and there was pushes from certain places that Atreus leaving should be a contentious thing. Like, uh, mm. you know, he and, and, and Kratos get into it and, and they separate, you know, in a, acrimonious fashion um and so like you know there are various versions of of the story in our heads and that i don't think that one ever made it to paper because uh for rich and i it felt important we wanted it to have that almost same feel as the lat as 2018 where it's a bittersweet ending um and it's ultimately kind of a happy ending but there's a, a little tinge of sadness to it uh, which, you know, having a blow up at the end with the Atreus leaving would not have accomplished that. It would have felt really unfinished. And you stack um, the Sindri thing on top of that. I don't think players could have handled it, man. Would have, <laughs> that would have been me. It would have been me. <laughs> Did, um, I mean, it's a diabolical little, um, I don't know, carrot to lure people along throughout this entire game of just calling the shot in the beginning of saying, hey, remember the end of 2018? Kratos is going to die at the end of this game. That is... I, we were just fascinated playing through the game and talking uh, about it amongst ourselves here at MinMax about just like, that is such a genius hook of just, this character is going to die. Are we lying? Find out. Play the entire game. Find out, please. Um, <laughs> was there ever any serious conversation about killing Kratos? Do you think that's even an option? Or was it just he's too sacred no matter what he has to live? There was the earliest earliest draft of an outline that we had come up with that we took to eric um we had uh kratos this is this is deep inside stuff but like uh you know ben we have a relationship now after you know many years That's right. uh but uh kratos died in the thor fight at the very beginning of the game oh wow uh and so you know at, you know he was gonna die and then it, it wasn't a permanent death. What was going to happen? And I don't care. We can tell this because it's never. It doesn't happen anymore. So this is all fan fiction at this point now. <laughs> uh, he would get pulled out of of hell essentially by Atreus. But it's now been like twenty years have passed. Oh my god! It's going to be a big time crazy. jump type thing. So uh, that was that was a version of it, and um, it just it didn't ultimately feel right. Eric was like, I don't want to do that. Kratos has died and come back from from uh from it too many times and it'll feel a little bit too oh you said he was gonna die and oh you just killed him but he came right back it does not gonna feel you know the the uh the hook the emotion isn't really there right. um and uh, and he was absolutely right and so that's why it didn't last very long um but other than that when as we were developing the story you know we knew that we wanted the story to be one about um letting go and and changing you know n- knowing that Norse mythology is all about fate and prophecy and everything. And we wanted to say that, you know, that's bullshit. You know, nothing you're only, written. you know, nothing is written that can't be unwritten. As long as you're willing to change, make changes in your life, then, um, then, you know, you're not bound to fate. And so when we landed on that, when we knew that that was the story we wanted to tell, we knew that Kratos couldn't die. Because then it would be like, well, are we going to just say that Kratos couldn't change? And then that would suck, you know? So right, like, right. Uh, it became pretty clear to us early that, no, nah, he can't die if we want to tell the story we want to tell. Do you feel like that uh, Thor kind of does kill Kratos in the game and just revives him really quickly? <laughs> was that a remnant of that? Is like a cheeky nod to the original <laughs> vision or is that completely different? No, that was completely different. Okay. That was just something that like, I had actually, I think I had pitched it and I wanted it to be something that like, 
it happens organically where um, if Thor kills the player, then he brings you back. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I don't, I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it was Eric who just really liked the idea or if the designers got a hold of it and said, that's awesome. And they just said, no, 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 we, we want this to happen. It's going to happen for everyone uh, instead of it being just a, a thing that could happen. So right, <laughs> that was right. just, just, we thought that would be fun. We it thought was the, fun. the electricity defibrillator thing would be fun. <laughs> Why not? Uh, yeah, Richard, in our last interview, um, you talked about how like there was an early version of the script for 2018 that got a lot more into the politics and Asgard and kind of backstory and you ended up just simplifying the hell out of that and cutting a lot of that out and saving it for the future. Was that all relatively intact or after 2018, were you kind of starting no, from scratch? No, for we, a lot of these ideas? we started over at that point. Okay. Yeah. We, we had to kind of respond to what we had done with 2018. Uh, so it changed things drastically, you know? So yeah, that one, that one's just, that's on the Sandman shelf of, of uh, you know, <laughs> things that just you know, stories that will will never be told, but were written and thought of, you know. Yeah. What was Odin like in that version? Um, I think he was more of a dick. Okay. O- overtly, you know. Right. A little more classic yeah. villain type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then the. I want to say softening. I mean, he's still a dick, just like a different yeah. kind of dick. It's tough to say the softening of Odin, but where did some of those influences come from for kind of a new approach to Odin, making him bend over backwards and seem reasonable at every opportunity, but just being uh, so influential and toxic in his own way? Well, I mean, part of it was just to subvert expectations of you know what, what you think he's going to be, but it was also just approaching him as a real character and as a real person and you know no one is that mustache twirling everyone's you know he's he's the hero of his story um so you know it it just felt false to have him be too overtly i don't know just angry and and dicky yeah and you know if if you're going to tell a story about atreus who we respect atreus's opinion if he's going to get in bed with this guy, he can't seem that bad. You know, right, he, right. he, there has to be a seduction there. There has to be an allure. And Odin became all about appealing to, to uh, Atreus's, what he was looking for, his sense of self, you know? Um, so that kind of changed the character a lot. Yeah. Was the mask always a factor? Oh, no. That was a more recent <laughs> that, thing too. That that one came late. We 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 knew we needed something, um, and the, yeah, the mask came up fairly late. And I I, I think it you know it, it came out of Atreus's search for identity, you know, and 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 the idea that Atreus is he's Kratos, but he's also Mimir, and he's also Freya, and he's also his mother. Right. And he, we wanted to make sure that in all the scenes. He represents one of those characters. He wears a mask, you know, he, he takes what he's learned from them and he, he kind of propagates that and, and it's part of his life. So, uh, so I don't know the mask felt right. Cause the mask is, is identity. Um, and the different masks that we always wear in different situations, it just, it felt charged. What was it had nothing to do with the Jim Carrey. Thank movie, you. I Thank you. Because I was doing the research. I'm like, is this? I don't think this is a thing from no, old mythology. One of the writers brought it up, you know, later was like, you, you realize that, you know, it was Loki's mask. And it was just like, just. Yeah. Just, we went, ah, oh, crap. Does that mean we need to change it? And we're like, no, it fits. Because it is it is about identity. Is he, that he's all those things that Rich said. And he's Loki or Atreus, you know, who, 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 who is he trying to be? So like, we, I, we're sticking with the mask. It, <laughs> it, it'll probably the, come the, up the mask universe, you know, like, <laughs> right. And then eventually we can have son of the mask, the whole thing. There's a lot of opportunities here. Uh, okay. Talking about the basically no fate, but what we may th- make thing here. Uh, I'm curious about the Norns. Like that section is so fascinating. Can you talk about just the process of coming up with how you're going to depict the Norns in this game? Well, we knew with the Norns that um, so much of Ragnarok, uh, not just the story, but the the myths of Ragnarok is about fate and prophecy and all the gods knowing how they're going to die and who's going to kill them and, and that right. they're all bound to this. And so they all know it's going to happen. Um, and so 
what we wanted to do with the Norn section, we knew this pretty early on, was that like we want to use the fates to completely clear the decks because we thought like with all the stuff going on in our game, it could be such a huge cognitive load to keep the emotional stuff, the father son stuff and, and the extended family stuff while also having in the back of your mind that, Oh God, fate and prophecy and everything. So we are just like, we just want to use the Norns to say fate's bullshit, you know? Right. And, um, and so when we, when we decided to, to approach writing it, we knew, like we said, all right, we're all, you know, old school theater geeks. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, this is going to be the most, it's either going to come off great or it's going to come off the most pretentious, like ridiculous writer talking to the audience thing that, that we've ever done. Um, but like, w- you know, that was kind of the thrust. And then we, uh, one of our writers, um, Anthony Birch, we, we said, all right, you, you take the first couple first stab at this. And um, when he first did it, it wasn't quite landing. And, and then uh, I just said, go crazy, really go hard at it. Speak directly to the player, treat it like it's a stage show. And you've got like an omniscient narrator and all these things. And he was like, all right. And then um, he delivered essentially that, that scene. Um, we made some small edits to it and stuff, but it, it, it was right where we wanted it to land and it and and there were people going are you sure this is gonna work <laughs> we're like i don't know we'll see yeah <laughs> and, and ultimately fate had to be bullshit because kratos couldn't die you know so we just had to figure out a way to articulate it where it was relatable where it made sense you know right that yeah you're you're, you're you're you get stuck in these in these grooves in these ruts and and you, it's hard to break out of them and in a sense that's fate you know yeah what how early did you come across that idea of i don't know i don't want to sum up your own game but just kind of that okay choose to be better is kind of the the crux of the entire game right like how early were you coming up with kind of central themes for this game or what was the first, maybe a better way to ask us is like, what was the first time in the game's development? Did you find like, ah, I'm getting excited. It feels like there's a lot of energy in this idea and this is something we can hang the whole game on. No, it was, it was very early on that we, 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 de- we developed a theme cheat sheet uh, for the writers and basically for everyone uh, and, and for us, you know, so that we always stayed on target because we, we had the major theme of letting go but we didn't want to handcuff the writers because it, you know, it's a, it's a big game, you know, and there's only yeah. so much you can do there. So we also had these related sub themes. It was uh, seeing past yourself, uh, PTSD and trauma recovery, uh, that idea that, that your, your choices define you. Uh, and, and that would, that was a theme, a theme that was directly continuing from the last game. Uh, it, nothing is written. And so everything the writers pitched and wrote had to slot into one of those categories. And I think that really helped feel, make everything feel cohesive and of a piece, you know? Yeah. But it also helped everyone see the path forward. It also gave us um, hooks in for not just the, the critical path of the story, but also for the exploration content. Because one of the things that we really wanted to make sure happens that we want, I think it's a goal of any game developer when it comes to having exploration type content is that it feels of a whole to the game. It doesn't just feel like side stuff that you don't need to do that each of our little bits of side content would deepen something for at least one of the characters, but they would all kind of relate back to the main theme so that we could kind of do our cloning and have our, our characters. um, Even if it, even if a story involves a side character, it can show something to Kratos or Atreus as you go. Yeah. You know, and I can I want to take this opportunity really quickly to give a big shout out to Anthony Demento and our player investment team. I think they're the the uh, unsung heroes of this game. They were such wonderful advocates for narrative, and they carried over all of our high level narrative goals and values into the subquests. They really pushed for them to be personal and uh, emotionally driven as the critical path stuff. And I don't think they get enough credit for their role in, in making the game what it was. I, I love those guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and on that note, I, I checked out the, the credits for this game and there's a whole section. You got like nine writers listening to the credits and then there's narrative technical design team. What, what does that mean? What is the narrative technical design? Well, they're the ones who make 
everything that we put on paper and record in the booth actually work in the game. Okay. Um, th- they also were very responsible for, um, you know, we would write, for instance, in, in the, uh, in Sindri's house in the realm between realms, we had all these little contents and bits of content, whether it's stories at the shop from Brock or Sindri or, or, um, you know, Freyer, like, <laughs> like high or drunk, you know, sitting on the chaise lounge or whatever, all these different, uh, things that we would write and they had to figure out how we could make it work, how things could bleed into each other and not get interrupted or stomped on. And, uh, and, and you know, they were the ones who really crafted the, they took our kind of like one-off like story bits and uh, made it work within the context of everything else going on around it. Jeez. Yeah. I assume they hate us because they, <laughs> we were the architects yeah. of their misery. So. <laughs> I yeah. guess it has to happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm curious about so many different random things. Um, the whole riddle, the the origins of the big running theme of trying to solve the riddle of what gets bigger the more you take away. How early did you strike upon that? Was that a throwaway thing you realized you could really stretch to make the ultimate gut punch? Or how did this come about? That was that was later. That was when we were developing the level itself. And that was, again, Anthony Birch. He brought that one in. Uh, we, we had the idea of the riddles, uh, but Anthony had to uh, populate <laughs> the riddles. And I think he, he had come up with that idea of, oh, we can have the payoff at the at the funeral. Am I remembering this right, Matt? Having the, the payoff I think at so, the funeral. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, we were always looking for one of the things that we knew we wanted to do as soon as, you know, we were driving towards, you know, Brock's tragic demise, spoilers, uh, obviously. Um, it doesn't really help when you say it after. No, it's really say completely thing, pointless, right? but yeah, yeah. It was a good uh, attempt, but, man. <laughs> but um, we knew we were always looking for ways. Okay, for you to really feel the gut punch, especially for people who, you know, may have been j- jumping into Ragnarok without playing 2018, you needed to spend time with Brock. So we were always looking for right. ways to spend time with Brock. And you got your stuff with Sindri because you're going on adventures with Atreus and everything. Um, but like, you know, that that's why we kept, you know, we had him go with you to Vanaheim, at least for the beginning of it and start the riddle there. And then we knew we wanted the adventure for, for Spartalfheim, the second trip to Spartalfheim. But, you know, over the course of development, you look at, all right, the scope of this thing is really large. we got to start making cuts. And that was the thing that was almost became sacred. And, and Eric was, it felt it was very important with him too. And he was pushing design to say, all right, well, we can cut out bits and the underground stuff with Freya and we can do whatever we got, but we got to preserve this stuff with Brock so that like, so that we land the gut punch later. Right. But yeah, it was in the course of, preserving time with Brock that it gave us the ability to pepper in more and more of the riddles just to, to, to make that land later. Yeah. Job well done. Um, Frey and Kratos, were there debates amongst the team about, do we hint about a little flirtations by the end? You always wanted to keep it completely platonic. What were the discussions like there? Never, 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 yeah, no, for never. Us, it, never. No, it, it, we, they've been through too much together. Yeah. And we never wanted <laughs> as much as I know that there are people out there who ship them and want them to be Freytos. Um, that was, that was never a thing for us because we wanted them. Kratos has too much uh, wrapped up in his son and, and his wife to even be thinking about any other kind of romantic relationship. And, you know, for Freya to go from wanting to kill this man who killed her child to wanting to be in a relationship with him just yeah. doesn't feel honest. Yeah. So like, uh, I think we just wanted it to be two warriors who've kind of come to an understanding and they have aligned goals and, and, and leave it at that. And you feel like just for this phase of their life, are you really enough forever? You're saying absolutely not. You will never see him kiss. If, if that ever happens, you know, uh, you know, that, that would be for some other team, some other writer and some other future project. <laughs> like I, I will never say it can't happen because I'm sure that there's a way to do that, that, that might feel earned and feel cool or something like that. Yeah. But, um, Time has to pass. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. They both have to die, then Atreus can bring him out of hell. It's a complicated thing. Yeah. So yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> On that whole fan theories and fan requests thing, um, I remember I think in our last interview about the last game, you all were very wary about diving too much into fan theories. There's always the problem of people accurately predicting the end of the next game and all this stuff. Um, what was that relationship like now in retrospect? Just seeing fan theories pop up were there any that you're like damn it that is a really good idea i wish that we were connecting these threads or what is that kind of dance with the very eager community predicting the future of events like we try not to read that so yeah yeah we try not to read it you know okay but now it's game on now you can go read everything right yeah now we can kind of go read everything okay uh i i think that um yeah, like I don't think there's anything that we really just go, oh damn! I now somebody said that and we can't do that, or or uh, that. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think for us, it's like I love seeing what fans come up with and like what what they're drawn to and 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 everything like that. But I I want to give people. <laughs> this sounds so f-ing pretentious. Excuse my language, but. <laughs> I want to give people what they need and what the story needs, not necessarily what they want. Um, because a, a lot of times the things we want aren't the things that like actually feel true and, and, and yeah. are what, what, what we need or the story needs. So um, yeah, I, I, yeah, we, I don't think that we, that's, it's really not that much of a consideration. The sure. consideration is making sure that, that fans enjoy what we're doing and we give them something that feels uh, uh earned and 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 feels um you know uh, like it sh- like it's how it should be right but it's not about like um you know uh, looking at their ideas and cherry picking or or avoiding because they said something right otherwise it's like okay then you would just get me only as the weapon and everybody would get exactly what they wanted and uh, it'd be kind of boring yeah. ultimately you know um so the whole idea of kratos was secretly the world serpent that must have come across your desk at some point right never that consideration did. Never. I think that that one actually surprised me. Really? If you can speak to this too, but just because I think that came from that image on the wall and Atreus, you know, holding Kratos and the, what looks like a snake coming out. There. Right. But like, if memory serves, I can't remember the exact language of it, but that was just a, a visual representation where swirling around there, I think it's almost like word balloons and it says lamentation or something like that in Old Norse. Right. And it's just his, you know, grief coming out. That's what it always was. And um, and then I saw the theories of like, oh, he's going to become the world serpent. And the world serpent, because of the algae and stuff, looks like he has a beard. So it's kind of yep. like Kratos. Yep. And he's white yep. like Kratos. And I was just like, whoa, that's out on a limb. Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one where Kratos was secretly tear. Was that ever a consideration? No. No, we, we knew, I mean, there, there was a reason why back in 2018, um, like we had, we had tier tier was always just supposed to be, um, the counterpoint to Kratos's in 2018 that all gods are evil. Right. It's to show that there is a way you can be a God of war. And it's this kind of like example to strive for because Kratos has many examples that show that gods are crap. Um, and so that's, that was tears purpose always for 2018. And then, um, yeah, no, I think that, that, that's, you know, obviously we did other stuff with him in this. Yeah. Even Richard going back to like that early, early draft of 2018 tier was always just kind of the antithesis. Early draft, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, he's, he was a clone. He was always a, a supposed to be a clone for Kratos of like, he, he was a God of war as well. <laughs> you were a god of war why weren't you like that like right, you, you right. could have you could have been more you, you be better you know um was it a challenge then when at least according to interviews eric has said that he pitched the narrative team on the idea of like yeah but what if he's odin the whole time was it a challenge to be like oh but that kind of robs this character that we kind of loved as his own thing i i but that's the thing i don't like i don't remember when it came up i thought it was fairly early that, yeah, that it, it was yeah. early because we even had a different version of how the reveal was going to happen. Uh, I think what, I remember at a, there was a time when we were driving towards, okay, Mamir's not with you for some reason. And, uh, or even if he is, it doesn't really matter because Tyr has the same eyes as, as Mamir. That's right. 
And so what we were going to do is like, all right, we're going to Asgard or whatever. And we go to the temple because Tyr, Tyr has the eyes and, and, and that, you know, he was going to, but since Odin doesn't really have the eyes and those are fake, it's all a, a, a glamour essentially. That was when it was going to all fall apart for him. Um, but yeah, that was, it was real early that we made the switch. I, I think, okay. it, I think it must've been as simple as Eric saying, uh, well, what if Odin is here and we go, we got to refactor some things. <laughs> and then, right. and then we went, you know, went to the board and started removing cards and, and, and figuring out how that would work. Um, but yeah, yeah no, it, it, is. it just, it felt, it felt like a good, a good twist as soon as it was fought up. Yeah, it's a weird feeling playing the game just the entire time. I'm like, what? why aren't you talking to Tyr more? Like, I want to sit down in that house and talk to him for hours. And everything's just kind of like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even like towards the end when it's about to fall apart when he has that line where he's like, oh, the mask. That's what Odin tortured me about. And it's like, wait, somebody needs to say, what, what are you talking about, Tyr? You have so much more information, but it all makes sense ultimately for why that has to happen. Uh, well, that was a, that was one of the tricky, not tricky things, but one of the things that we had to do and we had to keep going back to is going like, okay, Atreus is in Asgard and you see Odin in Asgard. So mm-hmm. if you go back to Kratos, Tyr has to be in the closet, you know, dealing with his PTSD and things like right, that. So, that, right. you know, yeah, so it was just, <laughs> it was like tracking those little threads to make sure it was possible for Odin to, to be in both places. <laughs> And, and to make it believable that he could trick both Mimir and Freya. Right. You know. That's tough. That's tough. Um, okay. I'm sure you've heard it. Seems like a big piece of feedback for this game, other than, my God, this game's great. Absolutely fantastic. A lot of people being like, why are these characters talking so much when I'm trying to solve these puzzles? And how is there not an option to turn this off? Uh, <laughs> did you expect that much feedback about it? Or what do you think, Richard? I'm, t- I'm going to throw this one to Matt. I'm hey, gonna... what do you think, Matt? <laughs> Uh, inside baseball for game development, you know, you, you try and get everything in and then you try and get it tuned. And, um, you know, towards the end of a project, you know, contractors start leaving and, and, um, we just, we didn't get it tuned well enough, you know, and, and it didn't get exposed to us until really until the game came out. Cause even when we had play tests, we never saw feedback about the yes. characters talking too much That's or ending too too quickly or yeah. something. It like wasn't that, until so. the game came out and it was like, well, shit, why? <laughs> if we'd known that, we would have, you know, we would have responded. It's, it, you know, that was certainly never the goal. I think it was just, you know, somehow the uh, the timing for the first hint was too aggressive and should have had a, a much longer countdown timer before something comes up. And, and uh, right, it's not going to happen again. Okay. No. Uh, would there ever be an option of patching in the ability to turn that off or to slow it down a little bit? Uh, I would love for that to be a thing, but I'm not going to write checks that uh, our good buddy John Burke would have to cash because that is that is some some coding that I don't know how difficult it would be. <laughs> okay. Is it a situation of like, you know, I think of in Vanaheim, I think it's the first area where it really, really hit me with Freya. Is it a situation of like, play tests, you realize people are getting stuck in this area. A design team says, what are we going to do? Okay, we can write some more lines for plug it in. Let's go ship it. Yeah, that okay. is exactly what happens uh, a, a great many times. Um, this isn't quite landing correctly. There, People are struggling here. What can we do? Well, the cheapest thing is to write a bit of banter to, to, to throw on there and, and we'll trigger it. Right. So. Okay. So was it it was surprising to see the feedback on the internet of like, oh, damn, this is hitting harder than I thought. Yeah, I think, you know, because um, we were thrilled to see that the game came out and and most most of the reaction was, damn, it's really polished. Not, not many bugs, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Because, you know, when you're making a game, uh, you know, sorry if this is a little bit too frank, everything feels like it's on fire until it's not. And it doesn't matter if that's, uh, if you're making a small indie project, which I have done before, or you're working on a big AAA thing, everything is a disaster until it's not. And so um, we're, we were, you know, just coming in screaming hot, trying to make sure that all, you know, all the plates are still spinning when we get that, that gold build made. Um, And uh, yeah, I think it it just kind of, 
it, it, it fell where it fell. And, and yeah. now we're like, damn it, I, we, we, we missed something. <laughs> you're, you're so busy. And like, I didn't play the entire game until it shipped. And I was playing like, you know, the retail copy and I'm playing it going, oh, shit, they're even hints way too often because, <laughs> you know, I hadn't played it. You know yeah yeah of it's course just, there was too there was too much going on there was too much to uh to service so yeah it happens uh i can't imagine what it's like to process this game and keep it all in your head and manage all this stuff uh what about the flip side uh surprises for dialogue lines that hit a lot harder than you expected things that were talked about more than you expected well uh death can have me when it earns me yeah. is the one that just like uh lit the world on fire and when you play in the game it's just a line in the middle of of a, of a sled story and i think it yeah. was you know because of our um our, our uh, creative services group and making that trailer and picking out cherry picking that line and it was like it was then when i went Oh, damn, that is a good line. <laughs> I, I, I remember, Matt, when you reviewed the script, you you said, like, damn, that's a good line. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was, <laughs> that's a really good line. Yeah, I mean, it, it killed in the trailer. And those are the amazing things. Then playing the game, it's like, wait, it's just when I'm riding across the snow? Like, it's just kind of, it feels almost like a throwaway yeah. moment. It's amazing. But yeah, hats off to the team that made the trailer. I, th I think the the other one was, and this is another, you know, like, we're, hey, he's not here, but we're going to leap more more praise on him on, on Anthony Demento from our uh, <laughs> from our player investment group. I think one of my favorite things to see is people, you know, players reacting to playing as a trace and a trace and going and punching the chest. Yes, for the yep. first time, that was something that he really wanted, and uh, and it it was it just ended up so wonderfully done <laughs> that like that one was was a big one too yeah that was struck too by so many people especially you know in the early hours of the game and the early previews and stuff that went up so many people were talking about hey this game's a lot funnier than i expected uh, it's a lot funnier than 2018 and it seems like a big uh kind of lightning rod for that discussion was the i do not need a snack line it's like that one really <laughs> that pulled its weight uh well done there i think when we did that when we did that scene and chris drop the line the way he dropped it we immediately went this is going to be a meme this has got to be a meme Ugh. just because it's just it, it was <laughs> it was it was landed so so well that feels like the, the, emo death. the emotional one the i think we always knew that kratos's story to atreus in the tent was going to have emotional heft but i right. don't know that i thought it would hit as hard as it did uh, and I think a lot of that is, I mean, credit to Bear McCreary for the entire game, but for that moment, just this nice, subtle, you know, sweet and heartbreaking music that he he played over that story and Chris's performance and the facial animation with our that our animators really had to um, to plus up, you know, from the performance capture was it, it all just all the pieces kind of came together and. and uh, on paper, that moment didn't seem like, I mean, it seemed like it would be a nice strong moment, but it didn't have the weight that it, it ended up having. Yeah, yeah it, it, that wasn't in the uh, in the original outline for it. It was the the writer on the scene, uh, Ali Sampson, who, 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 who brought that story. They were just going to kind of go to sleep. Uh, but, you know, I, I read this, the first draft of the scene and it had this whole story in there. And it was like, this part, you know, like, there, there was so much narrative uh, in that section because you're going up the bridge and you're meeting all the all, all the people who are going to take part in Ragnarok, and then you go into that scene, and then you're going to go into the Fade flashback, and then you're going to come out of that and have Kratos tell his speech before Ragnarok, and it was like there's going to be too much, shit, but it was so good that it was just you know we had to do it, and it uh, it, it all just came together beautifully. Yeah. Um, is there big stuff that um, was cut along the way? Things you regret losing? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, making a game. I don't remember. I, I want to. I'm going to attribute this quote to Peter Molyneux. And actually, no, I think it might have been Sid Meier. One of those two. One of the said something about game development being a series of um, heartbreaking compromises. Mm, that's right. uh, and 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 it's true. It absolutely is. And there's always stuff that you lose. There's stuff that got out on the internet that that we lost that we had, we we cut. Both for um, you know we have a lot of game to bring in 
uh, you know, bring all the way in and, you know, pacing. We wanted this kind of once you're on the path to Rag- Ragnarok, we wanted it to be more propulsive. Yeah. Um, but like that was a section that I know in particular for Eric Williams was tough to lose because there was some very personal stuff in there for him. Uh, but, you know, the good of the many. Wait, now which part uh, is this in particular? There's a, a stretch with another entire character named Sinmara, mm. uh, which is Surtur's love, that we had a, a chunk of the game. Um, that uh, we were going to, to you know, visit Surtur and then have to visit Sinmara and stuff like that. And it was okay. just like, this is starting to feel like taffy. Um, and people are wanting to get to Ragnarok at that point. And we've got a lot of game to polish, so we we ended up ultimately making the call the, the call to cut it. Um, but you know, it it hurt because there were some really good scenes we had, um, and I, she's in the credits because I think we we preserved her crying in the post game of Ragnarok. But Janina Gavinkar played Sinmara for us, and she delivered some emo- really beautifully emotional performances. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, that that hurt to lose, especially because you know she was giving giving everything on the stage, and it and it sucked to to cut that content out. Yeah, yeah, and no chance we'd ever see it. No, I don't think so. I you know I I can't ever say uh, sure. obviously for sure, but like I don't I don't think that Eric's interested in any kind of director's cut type thing because ultimately. Not only was it cut for scope, but it was, as I punch my mic, uh, it wasn't just cut for scope. It was also cut for pacing reasons to keep that propulsive. And so like to go back and put it all in, it's going to stretch that section out again, which is why we cut it in the first place. Yeah, it's it's a shame because, you know, we were going to have a Treas lie to her in order to get her to, you know, merge with uh, with Surtur and become Ragnarok. And, uh, and and that felt so charged to us because, you know, Kratos reacting to his son just blatantly lying to get right. what he needed, you know, was kind of was going to help be a wake up call to him, you know, that like they were they were on the wrong path here, you know, and, and something needs to change. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Richard, um, I know we're wrapping up here. Do you have a do you have a most exciting day? in the game's development, I know it was many years for you, but is there a moment or a day that stands out as your biggest kind of f- yeah moment? Oh, he just called you old. <laughs> he did, but it's, he's correct. Uh, you know, it, being on set, really? being on set and, and, and seeing, uh, and seeing the scenes come together is always, uh, is always amazing. Uh, seeing, uh, Odin the first day that we did oh, the Odin man. shoots and Richard Schiff comes in and he does his thing. It was just, amazing um as a writer it's difficult to be on set because you hear their lines a certain way in your head and you know when they don't say it the right way you're like oh that feels kind of wrong even though it's not and Schiff would come in and he would do it very differently than what was in my head but it was beautiful it was like oh my god like there's other layers going on here that i didn't even you know i didn't even see yeah um yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Actors. <laughs> actors, man. Real quick question. Uh, it's kind of related to actors. Um, Thor and the whole calm and reasonable person. Did you know that you were going to do kind of the last Jedi Luke Skywalker throw the lightsaber away moment with Thor in the beginning of this, that you were setting up for that twist of he wasn't going to go right into a fight with Kratos. He was just going to walk into the house and talk. Yeah, that was early. That, that was early. pretty early. early that was in- another one of those just subverting expectations. Just going, you know, what do you think is going to happen here? And it'd be much more interesting if, uh, if he just went in and that we, it was important that we meet the bad guys early yeah. because we don't see them again until much later. So it, Odin needed to be a, a, a visual physical presence, right? You know, he, he's only been in your mind for that whole other game. So it was important to kind of put him front and center, have him in there early, and then he can disappear for a long time. And that's also reliant on the no cut camera and how that changes everything. And it, I, would love to unpack that if you want to do a part two in any moment. I'm excited to do it. Um, but if it's a GDC talk, I would also love that. I'm just figuring out how that no-cut camera influences a story that's trying to be this big because you're getting more and more creative throughout the game of like, okay, we got to make this transition to this transition. But 
pulled it off. It's it's a wild labyrinth. Any, um, anytime you want a part two, you can have it. But we're yeah. happy to talk about. Oh, that great. Stuff. Okay, thank you. Uh, just run that up the flagpole at Sony. That sounds great. Uh, okay, uh, real quick, um, the Amazon show that's been announced. Are you two involved? Are you talking to folks? Are you just fully willing to hand it over? How are you feeling? Uh, we've done a couple a couple meetings with uh, the really incredible team over there. Um, you know, working on the pilots, we've seen you know outlines of things and and whatever. But it, you know, I you know ultimately, you know, I think that's 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 Corey is is working hand you know hand in hand with them, yeah. and, and we're kind of available to be checked in with whenever is is kind of uh, our role when it comes to that. I mean, what, what we've seen has been great though. Okay, yeah, that's good, good to hear. It's good. Uh, it's are good. you two, you don't have to say exactly what you're working on. You're welcome to, I guess, if you want to. But uh, what are you doing now in general? Are you relaxing? What What, what is your life like right now? <laughs> uh, we're we're trying to figure out that right now. We're trying to figure okay. out what the, what the next steps are. We have we have various things going on at the studio and um, uh, hands in, in, in all of them at, at, and on little things and, uh, and whatever, but yeah, we're just kind of, kind of just, okay, we can breathe now. Mm-hmm. Ragnarok mm-hmm. came out, people Sleep. liked it. You know, our careers are, are still intact. Uh, <laughs> we, I think let's, let's step back a second and, and, uh, and, and, and figure out in, in a very um, targeted and smart way what, what we're doing next. Yeah, right on. Uh, Richard, anything else you want to say? Matt, anything else you want to say before we close out here? No, just a big old thank you to uh, to you and to uh, all the people who've played the game and, and have um, shared their experiences uh, online or with us, you know, personally. Uh, it's, it's really gratifying. And I, I talk about, <laughs> like, those Let's Plays and things like that, watching people play the game. It's what we as developers get to do like film people get to go to the theater and sit with people who who watch their movies or or whatever and that's kind of our version of it because you don't want me sitting in your home while you're playing your game uh so it's it you know i i never take that for granted and seeing how our our story has influenced people wanting to make the make the cosplay stuff or whatever it's just uh it's a dream come true because you know we've spent Rich and I both many, many years working on things that hardly anybody played. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, I'm just grateful that yeah. we're in the position we are. Well, let's play Matt, the three there, rules. There, but there sorry, was Richard, something yeah. you once said to me, Matt, which was you work just as hard on the games that aren't well received as the ones that are. Right. And that, that truth stayed with me, you know, cause you just, you never know. And, and working on this thing was, was scary. You know, uh, folks became so invested in those characters and it felt like a real responsibility not to drop the ball for them and and deliver on sort of the the promise we made with the last game uh so you know it was an an incredible relief you know to see the reviews and to see fans responding to the narrative so favorably uh you know i'm glad we can uh yeah we can we can sleep now yeah okay richard and matt close your eyes we'll close, we'll end this interview with you two drifting off to sleep uh but thank you so much for joining us greatly appreciate it obviously very excited to see what you all are up to next and the entire studio is up to next but thank, thank you, you. absolutely and thank you so much for Thanks, watching man. or listening to this interview there are many more like it in the min max interviews playlist check it out if you enjoyed it throw a subscribe our way we'd appreciate that too all right thanks so much everybody goodbye Bye-bye. All right. You've seen the headlines. You know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends, and getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.